Welcome. This is our masterclass video on AR and gaming, where we're going to be talking about Spark AR Studio and how we can use that to build games for augmented reality. I'm Matt Roberts. I'm a product manager on Spark AR Studio. And I'm Edgar Neto. I'm a partner engineer at Platforms here at Facebook. So Edgar and I decided today to talk about AR and games because we're both really passionate about games. We both worked in games yeah. in our careers, and now a lot of the things that excited us about games early in our careers, I think uh, are we have a chance to, to do it again with augmented reality. It's a new medium, a new platform, and a new technology that we can use to try and create fun experiences for people, both building on the things that we know work for games, but also taking advantage of the unique capabilities of AR and uh, AR Studio and Spark. Yeah. The funny thing is that Matt and I actually worked at the same company before and now we're back in the same company again. Um, and yeah, like we, I think we're both kind of like driven by this vision that AR is going to be a revolutionary medium in the future. And we're now taking this next step where it's going a little bit less of just um, funny experiences and try to build it into um, new industries like gaming and other useful industries as well like commerce. Um, so it's really fun and really exciting to be part of this journey where we can kind of like try to take AR to the next level and make it more like industry um, relevant and industry ready with the technologies that we build here. We've seen over and over again with new media that one of the first things people want to do with new technology is build a game. Yeah. So we thought it'd be really useful to give some people uh, in this audience the hands-on skills they need to build their first game in okay. augmented reality. So I think today we're going to step through uh, a project that does that. And um, our, our objective today is to uh, basically equip this audience with the fundamental uh, capabilities that they would need to build a simple uh, social game yep. on top of Spark AR. Yeah. And uh, like with all the other masterclass videos that we've been um, doing here, the, throughout this video, we're going to be exploring a brief. So it's kind of like emulating what you would see in the in the real world, right? It's like you, you usually get a brief from either a necessity that you've identified in industry or um, some something like a client that a client wants to build. Uh, that brief is usually resumed into one sentence and uh, or one use case, and then you start uh, out of that brief to build uh, your idea, uh, build your assets, and build your... Um, ultimately your AR effect. So that's what we're going to be exploring in this video. We're going to start with the brief and then Matt and I are going to discuss how to uh, expand that brief into a um, full-fledged AR effect. Um, and yeah, hopefully we got some good results out of this. Yeah. Uh, you know, in any creative project, you have to have a plan. And mm -hmm. Edgar and I spent some time thinking about what our structure would be for mm -hmm. this project. And we decided that we wanted to build an AR game that's really social that people want to share the content that's created from it, that players find it very easy to understand and learn so we don't have to have excessive tutorials or explanations. Mm -hmm. And we also wanted something that people wanted to play over and over again. It yeah. was repeatable. These were our four main goals yeah. when we were thinking about what we wanted to build today. Exactly. So it's building an AR game that's social, shareable, easy to understand, and repeatable. That's our, that's our brief. So uh, we had four points there. Uh, easy to share, uh, social... Um, so social, shareable, easy to understand, and repeatable. So my suggestion is that we go through each of these um, characteristics of what our game should have, and then we explore like how do we um, bridge these necessities from the brief into something that can be translated into a game concept, right? So sounds good. Um, yeah. So should we start with social? Yeah, let's start with social. So, so I think with each of these, when I approach this, I think, how does AR actually make this better? Mm -hmm. And how can we do something in AR that would be different or unique to the, to the medium? Mm -hmm. um, and, and social is one of the easiest ones for me because mm -hmm. augmented reality is all about people. It's about faces and people and remixing yourself into uh, a virtual world or, or a fantastic space. So in terms of social, you can't have interesting AR without a person involved. So inherently mm -hmm. it's social. I also think that from a games perspective, some of the best games experience I've ever had are in person with other people, um, either with my family or with my friends, um, you know, and having having experience that we can have in real time yeah. together. So that's a very natural environment. I would I would say we should probably focus on doing something we can play together. Together, yeah. Are. So like uh, and together as in in the same space, right? Like the 
the famous local multiplayer that was kind of like what we would grow up playing, right? It's like you invite all of your friends, you're like in a, um, in the same room and then we're all playing together. Because yeah. like the, the concept of social these days kind of like it's diverting a little bit more through uh, these single player experiences that you're sharing um, in game moments. But you're right, like AR is about uh, augmenting the environment that you're in. So I think it really... Um, it has a really good chance to deliver a good experience if we're thinking about like people together in the same space, uh, uh, kind of like augmenting experience of a local multiplayer game. Yeah. So that's really cool. So uh, with social, I think like we really have a, a good thing if people are playing together. Um, and specifically, I think some of the types of games that we, we talked mm -hmm. about that would be good for this would be like party games, mm -hmm. things that you do kind of uh, for fun. It's not super competitive. It's really more about just having a good time with your friends. Mm -hmm. We talked about playing cards. Uh, we talked about... Um, kind of board games and one idea that we really liked was the idea of playing charades in, yeah. in AR. Charades is definitely like a, a very social experience. Um, it's something that you have to be together You have, and it's like super fun. There's lots of like uh, this kind of, you know, uh, excitement and sometimes lots of screaming because the time is running out and you really want to, to get that charade, right? So it's really social and it's really local. So I think like there's, there's lots of potential for an augmented reality game to do something in charades. That would be super cool. Yeah. So maybe we can think about how to use augmented reality to enhance a charades game yeah. uh, with props or some other kind of virtual objects. I think that's our creative starting point for how that we could make that social. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds like okay. it's going to be cool. Sounds good. So let's put a pin on, on social for a moment and let's move on to easy to understand. How do we make a game with AR and knowing um, we work on the product so we know uh, better than everybody like the... the the capabilities and the limitations of the product. So how do we make it easy to understand for people who are just like firing up a game in the camera, right? We need to remember that it's like they're not going to be downloading an app. That's what people are usually used to do with games, but they're actually going to be opening a camera and playing that game. So how do we make it easy to understand? Yeah, for me, uh, I think it's about a few key aspects. The first is the game has to be familiar. Mm -hmm. So we can't have too much excessive explanation. I think the fact that we're settling on something like charades that mm -hmm. many, many people already know how to play, that will give us a big advantage uh, because people will have some sort of notion about how to play that game to yeah. start. The second thing that's important is that we queue up the experience in the right way. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about how to use AR to inspire the players to behave in the way that they need to behave mm -hmm. for that game to be successful. There's gonna be some kind of visual cues, maybe audio cues, other kinds of feedback that will be intuitive for them to understand as they're using the experience about how they need to how they need to play the game. Yeah, that makes sense. And like, um, because this is a game, we also need to think about input, right? And the, uh, we we know like from from social games and from mobile games that people try to emulate uh, inputs from the previous generations uh, when they build a game for mobile. So, for instance, they build a game with. Uh, multi-touch and accelerometer but they emulate like a joypad inside of the game um, and how do you how do you think about input for a charades game that works inside of the camera well this is one of the areas where i think we have the most opportunity mm -hmm. and in fact i think the entire ar community has the most opportunity to innovate and explore mm -hmm. because interactions in ar are still actually relatively undefined i think mm -hmm. you make a good point usually when new technologies are adapted to this to some kind of format they Creators try and borrow metaphors mm -hmm. that worked previously or user interactions that worked previously. So I think we should probably do something there that takes advantage of things that people already know, like mm -hmm. text, for mm -hmm. example. That's something that's going to be really clear that we should use that I can see how that could work in AR. But also think about how interactions with the scene in terms of touch mm -hmm. and using the camera and um, the interaction with the, with the person in the scene. We should explore some ways to make that feel more natural mm -hmm. and um, not just to you know, try and simulate a bunch of buttons or, or something like that. We want to kind of be more immersed in, in, in context of the scene. In the camera environment. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I think we've talked about social. We've talked about uh, how to make it easy to understand. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, shareable. What do you think makes a really good uh, local party game shareable? Well, I mean, when people are having a good time, they want people to, to know <laughs> about it, right? That's it's the type of thing that you want people to join in or, mm -hmm. or do with you. Yeah. So I think if we can create a loop in the game where people are having an, a, a fun experience, there's excitement both from the people that are guessing the shreds and acting them out, mm -hmm. um, then we can capture that media mm. that happened and capture that moment. 
I think people are really going to want to share that yeah. uh, with their friends that weren't able to be there. So that's that's probably what we should focus on some sort of capture. Yeah, and that's that's the strong point about having a game working inside of the camera, right? Where the, sh the, the capture is going to be just so natural because you're already pointing the camera at someone. And we have a lot of mechanisms for people to share that that mm -hmm. media with their friends exactly on Facebook or on Messenger already. Yeah. So we have a they'll be able to, there's very low friction to getting that 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 fun moment out to the yeah. people they care about. Yeah, cool. So I think we've explored like uh, three or four four concepts. Um, moving on to the last concept, um, the the last concept that we we put in our brief is repeatability. Like we want this game to be not only social, easy to understand and shareable, but also like to be repeatable. We want people to have fun over and over with this game uh, inside of the Facebook AR camera. So, um, how do you think about uh, how can we leverage repeatability into a gaming um, concept with AR? Yeah. I would say this is one of the most important challenges of mm -hmm. any game. Mm -hmm. And I think if people in the audience have designed games before, they know that creating a repeatable experience that people want to play over and over again mm -hmm. is really the ultimate goal of any kind of game design. So it's also very, very difficult. We do have some advantages. Again, we're taking a game that we know has been popular for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, that many people learn very early in life and play their whole life with, with charades. I think that will help us. But when I think about specifically our platform, in this case, it is a little bit difficult to do a long AR session on a, on mm -hmm. a mobile phone. I mean, mm -hmm. people aren't walking around for 10, 20 minutes at a time using AR. So one thing that's really important for this session to be repeatable is that it's the right length. Yeah. It's the right duration. It's short enough that it's both fun and meaningful, but not so long that it basically wears you out. Mm -hmm. So I think the duration of the session is something we should think about, have that loop over and over again. And then I also think the repeatability in terms of the variety and randomness or novelty of how we're setting up mm -hmm. players to have a fun trades challenge is going to be important. So something that's new, that's short, that you can play over and over again, and every time you come back, it feels like it's slightly different, will be really, I think, the key to having a repeatable AR game here. And that that sounds like it's it's very doable because if we're if we're thinking about the concept of um, of a charades game, uh, we have a lot that we can augment the reality uh, uh, players' reality with. Uh, we can input uh, props. Um, and w when I think about the charade games with props, I immediately think about that uh, sticky note game where people put like a um, right. like a celebrity on their forehead, yeah. uh, and then the other people have to uh, um, actually like the person with the sticky note has to guess who is the person, uh, uh, the celebrity that they're impersonating. Um, I can see where we can put like a, a virtual sticky note on somebody's face, and then like using using the phone, we can actually make the the person um, who's being augmented um, try to guess who they are, and um, because the camera is already being pointed at them, we can uh, go back to what we've discussed before. Like, if we can actually record those moments and make it shareable. We can make sure that the sessions are short enough so that it's repeatable. Um, and yeah, it's, it seems like it would be like a nice local multiplayer version of charades with augmented reality. Yeah, that sounds like a really funny concept that people yeah. will, will laugh when they see this thing yeah. on their head in AR. So I think that, that, that's definitely, that's a fun idea. And especially because the person playing and trying to guess, they're not seeing anything on the device. So right. they, they have a lot of pressure to like ask the questions quickly and then the person filming them is going to be like, come on, come on, let's go. Great, so I'm really excited to, to work on this with you. Looks like you have AR Studio open. Um, it seems like the first thing we want to do is figure out how to get this sticky note on the player's head. Yeah. How would we approach that? So that's that's really great. So it seems like a good starting point. And it, uh, it's one of the things that's actually one of the strong points of AR Studio is like how easy it is to just like attach something and augment the person's face. Um, we do this by adding a face tracker, uh, which is uh, something that would just like track the person's face on camera. And... Um, you know, we can just add new objects to it. You can uh, add props to it. Uh, the face tracker will just basically um, make sure that we, we have information about where is the person's face, where is it headed. So if I just um, simply add, as an example here, add a face mesh, you can see on our preview window that the face mesh already is already attached to the person's face because of the face tracker. Why is it? Uh, black and white checker box like that oh that's because we don't have any textures attached to it yet so this is kind of like the default uh the default look to it once we assign a texture to something then it doesn't look like that and that's also what's going to happen when so i added the face mesh as an example but what we really want to do here is the sticky note right so the other thing that we can add as a child of the face tracker is a plane it's just basically a 3d plane that's what we can use for the for the sticky note and as you can see the plane also looks like a 
or checker just because it don't have any textures yet. So when the plane is a child of the face tracker, it inherits its position and orientation. And exactly. I see. And we have this video here just as a um, as a placeholder uh, of uh, a person just moving their face, but I can also just change the video to my own face, um, and then we'll see that we have a face mesh attached to my face and also the plane already attached to my face. So that's like. It's one of the strong points of AR Studio, which is like a couple of clicks we can track the, the user's face. So let me go ahead and just use that face mesh as a reference point to make sure there's no empty space between um, my face and the sticky note so that it looks like it's stuck to my forehead. And then I can go ahead and delete the face mesh. So the face tracker will continue tracking even without the face mesh? Yes, exactly. That's why they're a separate entity. So the, the tracker is really it's just um, a scene object that will keep um, translating face information into all of its children. I see. Um, so now what we definitely want is to make sure that the, the post-it or the, the sticky note doesn't look like a checkered a face, right? So um, what do you think? Should we, should we make it like this square type of sticky note or like the rectangular one? Well, we need text to fit. So it, the names are probably going to be somewhere between 10 and 15 characters long. So probably in the... It needs to be a little bit more rectangular, yeah. I would imagine, for the text that makes to sense. fit. So I can just go here on my plane and if I increase the X scale for a little bit, it already looks more like uh, the rectangular type of proportions for the sticky note. Um, yeah, so... Of course, you don't want it to keep uh, looking like this, like a checkered mark, right? So what you can do here is um, if we import an asset from our computer, um, this here it just will basically just import a texture. Um, what kind of files, what is that exactly when you say an imported texture? So uh, important texture is basically importing an image file from my computer that I can then attach this image file to our uh, 3D objects or our world space objects. Um, in this case, it's just like a 2D object that I want this to be attached to my to my plane. But at the moment, it's just in my asset library. It's just an image that I imported to my to my project, but it's not part of any of my uh, scene objects yet. Oh, I see. So you made this, and I see that there's an alpha cutout around mm -hmm. the edge of it, so it won't be so precisely rectangular. It will look more like a actual piece of paper. Yeah, exactly. Like it has a little bit of a, a little corner. bit of a curl to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and so right now it's just part of our asset library. Uh, in order to attach it to the plane, I need to make sure that it's um, part of a material. So materials are how we provide information to, to world space uh, um, scene objects. So they contain information like um, color, but also like how shiny that material should be and um, how it should reflect light. In this case, it should be very, um, very, very simple. So I'm just gonna call it um, sticky note material. What's the difference between a material and a texture exactly? So um, a texture would just contain information about a, um, a bitmap or a, a file that we imported from the computer and the material will contain much more information. So uh, with the material we can make sure we can make uh, shiny objects or less shiny objects, more opaque objects. Um, so these are a material is how a um, world object will react to, to light and to the environment itself, while a texture is just something that we can attach to that material. Ah, so I can think of a texture as a part of a material yeah, in most exactly. cases. Exactly. Okay. So um, in this case here, we have a sticky note material, and the shader type is standard, and it actually can have multiple different textures. We can specify one texture uh, to be the diffuse texture, which is the main texture that's going to show, but also specular, emission, normal, which are different types of textures that will show up different um, characteristics to that material. And what's a shader? Uh, the shader is, you're asking very different questions, Matt. <laughs> um, the shader are basically um, how, the, how the material is going to be defined. So a flat shader is just a material that doesn't react to light and doesn't react to the environment at all. Uh, standard material is something, uh, a standard shader is, uh, will make sure that that material uh, has some kind of um, interactions with the environment. We also have a face paint material that when you have a texture attached to it, it just uh, looks like it's being painted to the face when it's atta attached to a face mesh. We have um, different types of shaders here. Yeah, we could probably do a whole masterclass on shaders. At exactly. Some point. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot of 
uh, features there we could explain. exactly but for for this example i'm just gonna add um to my sticky note material a texture um and it's going to be a, a diffuse texture and now i just need to assign that material to my plane and now i already had there it kind is. of like a sticky note augmented on my forehead um well, I see what you mean. You can kind of see it's reacting to the light based on the position. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's not um, one thing that is important to, to emphasize is that this is not the real world light. It's actually reacting to this uh, directional light here that gets created uh, with the scene automatically when you create a new project. But it, it looks a little bit um, like it's reacting to the normal light because it's just like coming from the same direction. Um, so that's cool. How do we actually write on this? Cool. So the um, it looks like we already have our, our post-it. So the way that we add text um, is we need to add an object called a canvas. Uh, you can see we have a text object here, but it's grayed out because the text object can only be a child of a canvas. So the first thing we have to do is add a canvas. Make sure that it's um, world space canvas. Uh, the difference between screen space and world space is that the screen space is like a 2D canvas that we can use for UI elements. We can even use it later on to make sure that people know if they are using the front-facing camera that they need to uh, point to the back-facing camera and, and put some instructions with a with a screen space canvas. But for now, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use a world space canvas so that it can move into the 3D world because that's what we want with our um, sticky note. Um, and now, because I'm inserting something inside of the canvas, uh, the text node is not grayed out anymore. So I can just make sure that the text node is there. And now the text node just appears somewhere inside of the canvas, but I want that canvas to be part of my plane. So if I just drag it here into the plane, um, there you go. The text node is moving together with the plane, but it's um, not very aligned to the plane. So I'll need to change the scale a little bit and the position. There you go. Uh, I'll need to change the scale. Oops. So now you can see that the canvas is the um, orange border here on my uh, on my project, and now it's a little bit more aligned to my plane. Before it was just like this huge orange border, um, but now the text seems to have disappeared. It's just because it has a very small font size that you cannot see it in there. If we just increase the font size a little bit, we will be able to see the text, and it now seems to have all these borders that doesn't allow it to show um, uh, anything uh, outside of the first letter. So if we just fill the width and fill the height, we now have the text occupying the whole space of the canvas and we can put much bigger text in there. For instance, if we use, I don't know, Benjamin Franklin or, oh, that doesn't look good. I think we'll have to cancel the line spacing here. There you go. Now it looks like we can fit we can fit bit text in there, and it's going to kind of readjust itself based on the. Uh, so the text will fit in the canvas, not on like word processing or trying to wrap based on the exactly parameters that you set. Exactly. Yeah. So it looks like we already have something that we can um, play some charades with. So how how exactly are we going to make this dynamic? That's a that's a. That's a really good part. I think like we we have a um, a capability that we can actually write scripts into our AR studio. We we've explored in previous masterclasses like making dynamic um, effects with just visual programming. Um, but one thing that I wanted to explore here is the ability to actually like write JavaScript code that can make this dynamic. So the way we do that is uh, by adding an asset and creating a new script that gives us a script file that we can just add um, dynamic things from there. So let's start with just the, the very basic, which is just setting another text to that text node via code. So I'm just going to jump into my script here. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to import modules because these modules are going to allow us to make modifications to our project. And the first module that I'm going to import is the scene module. Um, the scene module, what it does is it allow me, allows me to search for objects that are in my scene tree here on the right. And then I'll have a reference to it in the code so that I can change them, uh, change properties in them. That's exactly what I want to do with the text node. 
So if I haven't worked with JavaScript before, what exactly is a module? Um, a module is uh, how I'm importing certain functionalities from the AR engine into my script. So um, the AR Studio and the AR engine, they will optimize your project to make sure that it doesn't um, package any modules that you're not using uh -huh. with your project. So uh, as I'm importing modules on my script, it actually um, is making my file size a little bit heavier by having these modules. Um, and my project capabilities are going to be aware that I'm going to be using these modules. But it's basically how I get functionality from the AR engine into my project. In this case, I'm getting the scene module. And the way I can um, make my font, font a bit bigger, the way I can make my um, uh, get references to my objects from the tree is by using scene.root.find. And then I provide to this method the name of my object. So the way it shows up here in the scene tree, in this case, text zero. So I'm just going to copy and paste this into my script. It's maybe overkill. And there's very little chance that I would have a typo on text zero. But this returns to me a reference to that text. So I can just assign that text. Um, let me say this is the celebrity text node. Assigning that to a variable. And then I can change um, properties inside of that variable. So for instance, if I just say text and now my celebrity is going to be called Matthew Roberts. Now, once my script runs, this is what, what my text node is going to say. So once you find the object in the scene by searching the scene module, exactly, you can assign it to a variable and modify the properties of that object exactly. via script. Yeah. I see. In this case, I already knew that uh, the text node had a text property. Um, but the easiest way to know which properties you can modify is just to visit our documentation on developers.facebook.com. Cool, so I already have our sticky note and we can change this text dynamically. Now, we are talking before about how we should have this uh, dynamically coming from a server, right? So what I'm thinking now is I should, I should build a very, very simple lightweight backend that we can just host the list of celebrities and then use networking module on my um, on AR Studio project to do that. What Great. Do you think? What I would like to be able to do is to be able to update that server and mm -hmm. then be able to have those names show up in the project without having to make a new AR Studio project. Exactly. That's that's exactly what like having these in a server uh, will bring uh, will bring to us. So um, what I'll do is I'll I'll take a little bit from AR Studio and I'm gonna go and build our backend on. Um, Glitch. Glitch is just a tool that allows us to um, just edit code on the browser and that runs as a backend for us. The, um, the limitations, we're going to use the networking module from AR Studio to download stuff from our backend. And the limitation on the networking module in AR Studio is that it needs to download information from a server that is um, already on the cloud and using um, a certificate signed by uh, an official authority. So it's not going to work with having a local service uh, running on my computer. And that's why having a service like uh, that allows you to just like prototype a, a, a backend real quickly will, will help us here. So I'm, I'm going to start a new project here. And I'm going to use a an Node.js template. Cool. So this um, is already a website running that I can just change the code and I'm going to download some of the files that I don't need. And delete some of the code that I don't need on the server as well. So right now, all I have is just a server that's online listening to my request and I can just um, make sure that it, it serves now my list of uh, celebrities that I want on my, on my project. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file. Oops. I'm going to call it celebrities.js. 
And what do you think, Matt? What what should we use for our celebrities? Do we use video game characters? Do we use Yeah, let's stick with the fantasy character idea. Fantasy so characters. I think you mentioned Santa Claus, Santa Claus, maybe some other Easter Bunny. Easter Bunny is a is a hit. Um, Tooth Fairy. And let, let's keep the this chart just for yeah. just for demonstration. So let's see. Um, Sandman. Sandman. Um, so this will be our celebrities. Um, of course, this is another module from our server. So uh, which not to be uh, mixed up with modules from AR Studio. This is not a part of the AR Studio code, but just like a a backend, a website that we can we're building. So. So the idea is this array of names is going to be downloaded by the effect and you'll be able to choose one of these names from the list. Yeah, um, actually what I want to do is that my server itself randomizes something and uh, returns me only uh -huh. one celebrity every time that I run the effect. So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm going to try to do here. Is this, um, there's going to be an endpoint called celebrities. So this is just going to be like my domain slash celebrities, or maybe I can just call celebrities because it just returns one at a time. Um, and maybe I can make my font bigger as well here. And what it does is it just, it's just a function that's going to randomize from that array. So I'm going to create a random number using math well, random. Um, based on the length of the array. And then I actually need to make a transformation on that number. Um, to make sure that I eliminate any decimals. And then the celebrity that I'm actually choosing, sorry, celebrity is that array indexed on my random index. And then I just send that back to the client who's making the request. So the celebrity is the chosen celebrity. So what that makes to us is if I just now add this to my server, what I'm gonna do is just request celebrities. require sorry so that should be my server already running and what glitch does is it creates these weird random names so I can just get the app this is uh, the website where my backend is going to be running and the endpoint that I defined before was celebrity this should return to me a JSON with celebrity and then every time I make a request to it it just randomizes another one. Now our array is very small, so it have it will have a lot of repetition. Um, That's pretty cool. You can see the potential for making something dynamic with uh, with Node as yeah. well. So yeah, that's that's a whole another topic I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a really cool example of how to bring in external data. Yeah, and um, of course there's like many other tools that you can just like build your backend really easily. You can build it in, you know, Heroku, Firebase, or Amazon Web Services. This is just like for effects of demonstration that we can just like edit the code directly on the browser. Um, but of course, like we, the only limitation is that it needs to um, be running on an HTTPS server, which it which it is here mm -hmm. instead of HTTP, and the certificate for the SSL needs to be signed by um, uh, an authority that is not self-signed. Cool. So now that we have a backend that every time that we run it returns a different celebrity, um, let's try to access this from our networking module. The first thing that we need to do is to import our networking module. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a chosen celebrity variable, which is gonna be null at the moment because we haven't done any request to the server yet. Um, and then, we're gonna use a method from the networking module called fetch. And that's going to fetch from my URL, um, 
and then uh, we can process the result. Um, before all of that, I'm going to create a constant with the URL, and that's our website here. And now I can just from networking, I can fresh from that URL. And the way networking, uh, the fetch method works is that it's going to return a promise. Um, so for that promise, what I have to do is I will call the then method, which will allow me to process the result. But there is also, let me make this a little bit more readable. There is also a catch method that will allow me to process any errors. So this is in case the network method fails for some reason, you can handle it exactly. in a yeah. proper way. Exactly. But um, ideally, the logic that you're going to put into the then method is what is going to happen most of the time. Exactly. Ideally, yes. But then we, we, we have the catch method just to kind of like capture, I don't know, if you're out of network or if you're trying this uh, somewhere where it's not going to work. Um, so, yeah. What we're going to do here, what we receive from the fetch method with the networking module is a result object that contains information about that request. So not just that JSON, but also has a request failed, has a request been successful or not. So our real success here means when the result status is um, 200 uh, and less than 300, this is... Um, HTTP convention for this uh, return uh, status codes. Um, and the status code is basically the code that tells you whether or not you were successful or some exactly. other information about the request. There's a, there's lots of, um, there's a consortium of HTTP that makes these uh, status codes. And we know that between 200 and 300, we have a successful request. Um, so in this case, we're just going to return the result dot json which should give us exactly this in case the request was successful ah, so we'll, we'll pass on the the name that the server gave us yes exactly and we, we can pass that on to another then method that we're going to construct here for now what we know is that if all the result uh, the result is outside of the scope here um there's there was an issue so it it could not be um could not be downloaded so what we do here is just we're going to throw a new error and we're going to say the HTTP status code is not what we're expecting. Um, and then if, we, if this error is thrown here, it goes right into our catch method. So now if we return this here, we can actually put on another um, then uh, method here that will allow us to capture that JSON and process that. Um, which is basically, if it returns here, it will be able, we'll be able to process the JSON here. So in case we have a successful JSON, we know that this variable called chosen celebrity will be the resulting JSON dot celebrity, which is the name of our property here. Um, and at that moment, we can also send uh, change the celebrity text node to ready. We are ready to play the game. Because we have the celebrity to guess. We have a celebrity to guess, exactly. Now, in case there was an error, the first thing that we want to do is we need to show that to the user, right? So we can just say there was an error um, fetching or fail to start the game, right? Fail to start so that it fits sure. on our post-it. Um, Cool, so let's give this a try. I'd suggest that we would add some more celebrities here just to make sure. sure that we have something else. So what else can you think about? Fantasy characters. How about uh, Tom Sawyer? Tom Sawyer. Um, we could think about, I don't know, Jack Frost. Just so that we have a bit more, um, bit more variations and then we know that it actually worked. So let's go back to our AR Studio project, it says fail to start. Oh yeah, and actually that makes sense. Um, it makes sense because once we import the networking module, we 
AI Studio by default won't allow you to make requests to any backend. We need to specify on the project which backends it can make requests to. So the way we do that is going to project, properties, and capabilities. It knows from my script that I'm already using the networking module, but then I have to come here and whitelist the domain. And my domain is this one. So once I whitelist that domain, there you go. Our so any requests ready. to that domain will be blocked unless you add it to exactly. the whitelist. Yeah. So now we know that it's ready. Um, and we know that we have a chosen celebrity. Um, so cool. we should be able to, to show that to the user. Cool. Well, it looks like we're, we're ready to um, start coming up with random celebrities. And mm -hmm. now it's met my need to be able to edit those celebrities. I can just go to our server, change that list. Exactly. And add or remove celebrities as I need to. If tomorrow there's like a flash celebrity showing up on, online, we can have it ready on our, on our code in like a few seconds. Fun. So maybe we should go back and focus a little bit more on the user experience now. Mm -hmm. For example, we need this to be a time limited game. Mm -hmm. How are we going to actually communicate that to the user yeah. in the app? Um, so one thing that is really cool is that we're now using an effect that is already limited by the time that you have by recording on the Facebook camera, but we need to communicate to the user that is, he's almost running out of time or, or she's almost running out of time. So one cool way that we can do that is we can put like a particle effect mm. that uh, splashes out of the person's face. See, I like that because it's a little bit more natural and interesting for AR because it's actually part of the scene. Yeah, That's exactly. Cool. I like that yeah. concept. So, um, yeah, AR Studio allows us to create particle effects really easily. But, but when you say particle effect, what exactly does that mean? So a particle effect is something that will um, emit with a little bit of certain, uh, or with a little bit of randomness, um, the same particle. So you can think about, for instance, if you have a rocket flying, the the fire behind it could be a particle effect, or the uh -huh. smoke behind it could be a particle effect. It's just basically procedurally generating the same particle to be um, randomized across the across the scene. And if we want to do this, like you said, on an augmented way, um, I think the first thing we need to do is make sure that it's a part of the face tracker, because as we've seen before, it's going to be um, attached to the person's face, right? And by default, it's going to be attached to my nose, which is already pretty fun. So what's flying off there right now? What are, are those particles? Right now, these are particles. And because I haven't assigned any textures or materials to them yet, they have that default check, uh, checkers uh, kind of texture. Um, and right now they're just flying out of my nose. Um, so what we can do just to make it more fun is um, let me import from my computer another texture. And I'll create a material, which is going to be the particle material. And that material has a texture of my watch. And I can make sure that my particle effect is emitting that material. And now I have like um, watches coming out oh, of my nose. Right. When, whenever, like this, this is already pretty pressing. Yeah. Um, but it also blocks the visibility a little bit. So uh, there's several properties that you can play around with the particle emitter because these are all being generated procedurally. Um, there's no need to actually create an animation for them on a separate software. We can actually change lots of properties. So, and these are all here on the right side on the inspector. So one thing um, we can change is to make sure there's many different types of emission. So this one is a point, it's emitting from a point in my nose. Um, but I can make sure that it's like, for instance, a ring. Um, and then as you can see, it already changed the emission to be as if it's like all around me. Um, and to make sure that it's even more pressing, I can maybe just rotate it. And now it looks like the, the watches are coming out. Oh, uh, so you rotated the emitter so that the particles, instead of going up, are now going toward the user. Exactly, yeah. And now it feels like there's not, um, it, it feels like they're a little bit slow, so they're not really um, generating enough uh, pressure. So I can actually just increase the birth rate for them. Uh, let's make them 60. So they're now a bunch more clocks. Mm. And on the right side here, there's always a percentage that you can use, which is like the amount of randomness for that. So 
I can put a 60 birth rate, but also with like a 20% randomness. So that it's like the birth rate is uh, has a certain variation to it. The same thing I can do to the scale. So they're all generating with the same size right now. I can just make sure that it has like a bit of a variation on the so scale. So that's the scale of each particle. Exactly, the scale of each particle. So changes. every time it emits a particle, it will randomize the scale of the particle based on the settings in there. Exactly, yeah. And can a particle emitter be a child of any object in the scene? Yes, uh, the particle emitter can be a, a child of any object. In this case, since it's uh, a child of the face tracker, you can see that it's moving right. around with my face in there. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so yeah, so that already, let me put the emitter a little bit more to the back so that we have a little bit more visibility. So yeah, this looks like it's a nice effect for when you're running out of time. Cool, I like it. Um, cool, now what we're thinking about is that like we always have, we, we now have this game kind of like ready, but I think what we're missing is like a starting point, right? Right, we need a timer. We need to actually figure out how long it's gonna take to play the game. Exactly, yeah. Um, so in this case, um, we're going to have a, a the matches are going to last 20 seconds because when you when you start recording, um, you're going to record a maximum of a 20 seconds video. And then once the, fin the video finishes recording, we're actually leaving the effect because the Facebook camera will try to show you the video mm -hmm. again. Uh, so that when you're back to the effect, you're already automatically going to randomize a new celebrity. Um, so what we need to do is to make sure that we show that particle only when the, the time is almost up. So let's say, when, when should we start to show the particle? Like five seconds towards the end? Hmm. Let's give a healthy warning, maybe like seven seconds? I seven seconds towards the end, okay. So let me first create a constant here and that's going to call um, warning time. And that's going to be seven seconds before the end. And we know that the total match time Is going to be 20 seconds because of the how the Facebook camera works. Um, so now we can use the time module to make sure that we uh, will start to uh, generate those warnings. But what we haven't found here yet is like a way to start the game. So we're right. thinking we're talking before about how to actually start the game only when you start recording, and that's what I think is going to make it pretty fun. Uh, like so when we need you, to we need to have we need to know when that recording event happens so exactly. that we can trigger the right moment in exactly. code to start the game. Yeah. Um, and for that, we have, um, you guessed it right, another module <laughs> that will allow us to see to get information from the camera, uh, events from the camera into our scripting. So there's a, a module called Camera Info. And that module provides us with information about how um, is the camera recording, is the camera taking a picture, which is pretty fun. In this case, we can actually start the game only when we start recording. Um, but it's pretty fun, for instance, when you have instructions on the screen for your AR effect, you can make sure that these instructions disappear once the person takes a picture or starts recording a video so that it doesn't end up in the media that's mm -hmm. captured. Um, yeah, so at this point here, we already have a chosen celebrity. Um, and then we can start to get information from the, the camera info module. Uh, the camera info module has a property called is recording video. Now, um, the AR engine, uh, it uses a paradigm called reactive programming. Um, and that paradigm means that um, most of the information that we get from the AR engine comes in signals, not in values. And signals are basically values that are going to change with time. So this name here is recording video sounds a little bit um, that is, it should be like a Boolean value. It should mm -hmm. always be like true or false. Um, but it's important to emphasize that the, the script, the whole script only gets executed once. Um, I've seen some people in the community that think that it gets executed on every frame. Oh, kind of like a, if you've done game programming before, like every exactly. frame update, you might run through your whole logic again. That's, exactly. not, that's not the case here? That's not the case here. We're, we're building a script that only executes once when the effect starts. So if you want anything that gets updated on each frame, you need to make sure that you subscribe to signals and uh, perform changes once these signals change. So the when you subscribe to a signal, what does that allow you to do exactly? That allows you to execute a function every time that that changes. So if you, for instance, 
subscribe to the signal of uh, milliseconds changing, then you would have a behavior very similar to games, which is uh, performing updates on every frame. Um, but in this case, we really we can be really picky about which signals we want to monitor and subscribe to so that we don't impact negatively the performance of our effect. So if I subscribe and act upon too many signals too often, that could really slow down my that effect. That could slow down performance. Because yeah. there's just a lot of work happening. For yes, there's a lot of safe. custom code to be executed so on each frame. So the least amount of custom code that you have executed on each frame, the, the faster your effect is going to run. Good to know. So in this case, where is recording video is a signal, and that signal changes once we, we have um, uh, the user actually interacting with the camera button on, on the Facebook camera. Um, and by monitoring and subscribing to this signal, we don't have to perform changes on every frame. We really we can only perform changes once the signal changes. So the signal will only change when the button is pressed or exactly. when it, it stops recording. Exactly. Or starts and stops. stops. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like an event, but we will do it more in this context of reactive signals. Exactly. I see. Yeah. Um, so in order to perform changes when the signal changes, um, I need to monitor the signal, and then I have to subscribe to the ch to the signal. And our subscribe subscription just to to keep our performance even more uh, optimized. When we subscribe to a signal, we can say what are the values that we want to to have a snapshot when that signal changes, uh, so that we don't have to bring in all of the engine's um, values into that um, frame update. So uh, that's why subscribe with snapshot takes in a value, and that value is um, is just a JSON where I can uh, give in a name. For instance, in this case is is recording. This is the name that I'm giving. And that is recording property should be filled in with my with this signal here. So by subscribing with the snapshot, you're selectively choosing which events you want to respond to. Exactly. By specifying them in the argument for the subscription function. Exactly. So we'll only fire if that specific event happens. Yeah. Gotcha. Exactly. So uh, it this uh, function will be called every time that this uh, this signal changes. And it will provide to to my function as an argument everything that I subscribe to in the in the snapshot. So, and I'm guessing if I want to know what events are possible, this is all documented. Yes. On the site as well. So yeah. different signals may have many different kinds of events that I could subscribe to, and yeah. I want to think about which ones are most important to me. Exactly. That's yeah, cool. and we're co constantly uh, working on improving our documentation and the reactive programming. We it's something that we're really focusing on right now on improving the documentation. Um, so hopefully it's going to be, um, we'll, once we rewrite the documentation, there's going to be a lot of examples to download from there. Cool. So this snapshot is going to be uh, basically a, a JSON object that's formatted like this. Uh, and then as I'm now listening to the changes of this signal, I can then uh, just check for the snapshot. Um, if the new value is true and the old value is false, then I can set, this just means that now we started recording and previously we were not recording. So that's going to be the moment when you press the button. Exactly. That's because it wasn't recording before. Exactly. But now it is. Yeah. So now I can send the celebrity text node to the actual celebrity. Um, and now I think that we can already start to test this on our AR Studio player. So we're gonna connect our phone and try to try to showcase that this is actually working now. So the behavior that we're looking for is that the post-it note, the sticky note, only shares uh, ready, and as soon as we start to record, it should say the name of the celebrity that gets randomized. Cool. So we. Um, we can now test our code on AR Studio Player on our device, on our mobile device, so that we, we test everything. Before we do that, I think I've realized some some typos here. So just wanted to make sure that I fix them. So I imported uh, camera info, and then it turns out that I never used it because I had a typo as camera info module here. So let me just delete this and this. And the other thing that I forgot to mention 
is that um, when we return here, we need to actually return the JSON method, which uh, returns another promise that we can just get through here on the, J on the 10 function. So now our script should be able to work. And we have now um, your phone connected there. So um, yeah, this seems like if you, if you just go back to the menu uh, and we can mirror this, refresh. And now, because our code shows um, that we're only going to show that celebrity text once it starts recording, it should see you should see it only saying ready, but then when you start recording, then you should see it switch it up to our randomized celebrity. Cool. Um, right now, our particle effect is like always on, so it's something that we need to change, but what we know is that the randomization of the celebrity already works, so that's pretty cool. That's great. Now we need it to work on the back camera though, don't we? Yes, exactly. They, this game doesn't really make sense if, it, if it's on the front camera. So. Um, First, I'm going to hide my particle emitter, and then we can add some scripting logic to make sure that it only shows up seven seconds to the end. Um, but yes, you're right. First, let's fix this for the back camera. So what we want to do is get this whole plane here only available on the back camera. Let's change here to back camera, and then we know that it's going to be there, and it's ready. Um, and now it shouldn't be visible on the back camera, on the, on the front camera anymore. Um, the other thing that we needed to fix uh, is if you fire up the effect on the front camera, you need to have some kind of warning to switch over the camera, right? So this we can do with the canvas as well. So let's insert the canvas here. And this one will actually use screen space. So this is uh, not going to be a canvas that's moving around in the world, but it's actually... It's more like a UI element UI that element. we can use to... Exactly. Explain to the user what to do. That's exactly it. And we have two options when we deal with a screen space, screen space canvas. One is full screen and the other is safe touch area. The difference between these two is that safe touch area, it will um, create an overlay that is only allowing you to place 2D objects outside of the UI elements that the Facebook camera puts, like the the tray with the effects right. and the button, so the shutter and, and the shutter and yeah. everything. Yeah, so we're just uh, gonna use the safe touch area for now, um, and we can see that it already created this like orange border here on our project, and that's where our canvas is. So we have one world canvas. I can actually just rename this to world canvas, and this is going to be our screen canvas. Great. This screen canvas should be enabled only for the front camera. So let's switch it up now for the front camera. Oh, sorry. Preview. And the only thing that you should have on the front camera is um, a text node. We're going to create a text. And that text is going to say, please use the camera or just like flip the camera. Do you think that's a good enough message? Or yeah, I think it? people will know what that means. Okay. So I'm going to make it fill the width so that it's uh, adjustable to the width and the flexibility property makes sure that it adjusts to any um, device screen size and aspect ratio. Uh, so we got that taken care of for us. And in terms of color, um, we Black's a little hard to read. Yeah, that's true. Should I just go with white? Yeah, I think white will work. Okay. Okay, so flip the camera is our instruction for the front camera. When you go to the back camera, you actually have a game. Um, and because we use a face tracker, by default, when the back camera doesn't find any faces, it just it will just um, create that instruction of like find a face to play the game. Let's try this out now and see how it works. I refreshed it and let's see. Okay, so now the front camera just says flip the camera. Okay. Flip the camera. And now no, find a face. There we go. I think oh. that's what we're looking for. Yeah, but now the default text is still Santa Claus there. So we need to change that to make sure ah. that it says ready. Um, yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah. 
And uh, the bug was introduced because we now created two different elements with text with, that has the same name called oh, text zero. Right, so it resolves, it doesn't know which one to resolve. Exactly. So we, we can just rename this one to instruction text. And now it should be fine. Now it should have the ready if we try this out and show it. So flip the camera. That makes sense. Ready. Let's try the, sh the shutter. Yeah. If we start recording. Oops. There we go. Recording now. Yeah. Now I can see on my computer who I am, so I'm not going to start asking questions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we could actually play it. We could actually play we've it. Got, we've point. got the, the basic loop built. Which exactly. Is great. Cool. Yeah. Nice um, work. Cool. So I think the only thing that we need now to add is to make sure that we, we, we give that particle effect, something like a, a pressing, um, so that we, people know that they're almost mm -hmm. out of time. In order to generate um, something that we can actually keep track of time, I'm going to use another module called the time module. And I'm going to import it here into my code. And the time module contains uh, functions that allow me to, like I mentioned before, not only to execute something every frame if I want to or every millisecond if I want to, but also it contains functions that allow me to uh, dispatch a certain part of my code at regular cadence and I can start and stop this cadence. So it allows me to just like manipulate time like that. Um, so I imported the module here. I'm gonna delete this test code here and I'm gonna keep a nice space for my constants and for my variables. Uh, and I'm gonna create another variable called remaining time. And that's always going to be initialized with the total match time. And what I'm gonna use this variable for is it's gonna keep track of how many seconds left in the recording. So it's gonna start with 20 when you start recording and then it's just gonna decrease. And then I can compare this with warning time and then display the particle effect. One thing that we're also going to need here is a reference to our particle effect emitter. Right now it's hidden. And what I want to do is via code to be able to just set it to visible and then it's going to be uh, um, visible. Um, but right now we just don't have a reference to it. So we might also want to create a reference to it. Um, and I'm just gonna create is my emitter or particle emitter. And I'm gonna use the same strategy here, scene.boot.find and my emitter zero, which is the default name given to it. Um, cool. So now let me start by no uh, I'll know that once the user has started to capture the, the video and the celebrity has been chosen and has been displayed, that's when I want to start my timer. So I'm just going to create an empty method here, start timer, start countdown. And I know here as well, when we're subscribing, that if the new value uh, of the snapshot is not going to be true, it means that the person has stopped recording. Now, this is basically something that's only going to, uh, to happen on AR Studio Player. Right. Because that's when you can start and stop recording a video and you're still in the effect. When you're on the Facebook camera or the Instagram camera, the messenger camera, once you stop recording the video, you go to the video player to preview what you've just recorded. And that stops the effect, which means if you press the back button, you actually restart the effect, you get a new celebrity. That works well for us. So I'm basically going to be creating this part here just for um, making testing simple, uh, simpler on Spark AR Studio Player. And these are new functions that you haven't defined yet. I haven't defined yet, so I'm just going to create them here now. Um, so one is going to be start countdown. And the other one is going to be stop countdown. Um, so yeah, for countdown, I'm going to use the time module to be able to create um, a timer. And that's with the set interval function. So um, I can just use my time model, module and then set interval. Set interval receives a function that will be executed at certain intervals. And the interval is defined by the second argument, and that's the amount of time in milliseconds that you're going to be executing this function. So in this case, I want to execute this function every second. That means every 1,000 milliseconds, I'll execute this function here. Right now, it's an empty function, so let's just um, give it some logic. Every second, I want to make sure that this remaining time is now um, decreasing by one. And that's what this operator does. It's the same as saying if 
people are familiar already with JavaScript, we know that this is the same as saying this, remain time minus one. Um, and now I already have like a countdown that I can, um, uh, this variable already knows how much time I have left. Now, what I just need to do is just to um, make sure that I display my emitter there. So if the remaining seconds, the remaining time, um, if we have reached the warning time, um, then we can just set the particle emitter to not hidden. So that's going to be displayed. And at this point, we can also stop the countdown. That's because the countdown here is just, re just really an internal counter for us to know when to show the emitter. Right. It doesn't actually stop the game. Because it's a 20 second limit on yeah. the recording automatically. Exactly, so we, we don't stop the game. We don't display that countdown anywhere. Uh, so we can actually at this place also stop the countdown. Um, and to stop the countdown, the countdown is created by this function. So I need to uh, actually store that somewhere. And I'm going to create a variable here for it. Countdown timer. It's going to be no. And I'm going to associate that variable to what's returned by the set interval. And then I can, in the stop countdown, just use my time module again to clear interval. And that receives the interval that was created before. Um, so yes, this should be, this should give us the, um, the particle effect. Now let's test it again on the mobile. For testing effects, let's make it a little bit, um, let's give it a little bit more time. So like after, te after 10 seconds, it should start the, sure. the mobile just for testing. Um, but yeah, let's mirror this to the phone. See if this works. Um, okay, this should okay. be Okay, reload. Find a face. There we go. And now let's give it a cup. If you start recording, let's see if the 10 seconds limit is applied. So Am I alive or dead? Am I? <laughs> do I live in the North Pole or not? <laughs> you have a, a, a gray beard. Oh, you're running out of time. You, yes. bring, you make, bring joy to oh, children oh, all wait, around wait, the wait, world. Wait, I'm Santa Claus. Oh, yes, yeah. you got it. <laughs> all right, so that's our charades game. Um, I think we'll have all the features that we need. Uh, right now, this is, um, as you can see, it remained with Santa Claus and remained with the particle emitter. But that's not how it's going to work. Uh, on the AR Studio player on the Facebook camera because it just resets. But it reset the, the effect reset because the effect. after the capture is finished, it'll take it to the camera roll and yeah, reset, exactly. and yeah. then you can load the effect again to play. Exactly. One thing that I realized there is that the particle emitter is still shown on the front camera and back camera. So let's just remove it, and now it's only shown on the back camera. And that's it. This is it. I think we have a pretty good charades game. Let's try it once more. Yeah. Sure. All right. So now I'm gonna try not to cheat. I'm right. going to try to guess who, are, who I'm really So am. reset me on studio. All right. All right. N not like we have a lot of options, but Ready let's see. to play our, our charades game. Here we go. Go. Am I real or fictional? You're fictional. Um, you're, uh, you're, from a, you're from a book. Uh, from a book. Um, I don't know. Maybe Tom Sawyer? Hurry up. Oh, yeah, I see you. <laughs> How did you know? All right, yes, you got it. Good job. Oh, cool. So I actually, I forgot to show that on the screen because I I was trying not to cheat. So let's actually check out some of the recordings that we got. Can you yeah. mirror the... Yes, now I'm mirroring that on the screen. So here we go. Yeah, Very cool. Yeah. So I could now share this. You could share this uh, in, in the Facebook camera. Yeah. This is the newer one. So we caught that moment. It's short, it's shareable. Something I might want to play again. I think yeah. we hit our main goals here. I could send this to a friend and maybe convince them to play it with me. Yeah, awesome. It looks like a super fun game. I definitely will play that in the party. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, so actually this was all so simple to build that I even forgot to save the project. So if I close the RST yeah. now, I, I lose everything. But do that. it's not a good practice to not save your project. Um, 
So the last thing I'm thinking about is obviously we want as many people as possible to experience mm -hmm. this. Is there a way to make sure that it's optimal and small? Yes, that's a very good question. So um, if when you build an effect, you need to make sure that it's under a two megabyte limit so that it reaches as much people as possible. Um, so that's downloadable over even for network connections. And the way to do this, uh, if you go on the project menu, we can see show asset summary. And that will show us for each one of the distributions for uh, of AR of this AR effect um, how big it's going to be the download size. So I in see this our case, textures. Oh, it even yeah. tells you about the font. Exactly. So the the textures and the font. And in the end, as you can see, we have um, we're far below the two megabyte limit for uh, this is like broken down by assets. Uh, but if we want to see actual the total project file. When we try to export it as well, we get a nice summary of on iOS. It will go, it will be a total of two hundred ninety megabyte kilobytes, but ninety nine kilobytes for downloading because it's compressed. And then Android, uh, hundred kilobytes for downloading, and other Android nine kilobytes. So we're way below our two megabyte yeah. limit, and it's going to be able to reach different audiences with this game. Yeah, that's smaller than many web pages. That's yeah. a really good outcome. Well, great, Edgar. This has been really fun. Um, I'm really happy we were able to think about what we wanted to do creatively. And we made something that was social, that was shareable, that I think is really easy to understand and people could play multiple times. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually really happy about the, the result. Yeah. Combining things like face tracking and dynamic network calls and text uh, in the scene, as well as some JavaScript. This was actually pretty, pretty interesting how we were able to combine those things. So awesome. nice work. Cool, and um, I would like to also hear the opinion of the people watching this video. Uh, if you have questions, if you have feedback, uh, please reach out to your DevC lead, or if you're watching this online, uh, make sure to co post comments. Uh, and we're actually going to be recording a new session um, uh, at the end of all the masterclasses, um, answering the questions from the community. So I really like, like to, to hear from the community what they think about the video, the tutorial, the documentation. Um, so feel free to reach out to your DevC lead and or, or post comments below.